The next case is a recurrent metastatic uh, uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma case. Uh, this is an 82-year-old male uh, from Florida with a history of multiple uh, resections of uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma on the neck, back, and shoulders, uh, who presented with a new uh, preauricular uh, lesion. The biopsy revealed a deep lesion, uh, more than seven millimeters, uh, that exhibited uh, perineural invasion, obviously high-risk uh, features. Uh, he underwent Mohs surgery of the primary tumor uh, that was uh, performed with uncertain surgical uh, margins, and therefore there was an indication for adjuvant radiation therapy uh, for uh, up to 60 gray uh, that was delivered. Uh, the patient was followed. Uh, Follow-up uh, scans revealed early disease progression with multiple pulmonary uh, nodules, and fortunately, uh, at the time, he was started uh, on systemic therapy with the combination of carboplatin and paclitaxel. Uh, receiving three cycles. Uh, he had follow-up imaging, which showed stable disease. Uh, uh, a few months later, repeat imaging showed disease progression in terms of pulmonary nodules and multiple lymph adenopathies, including mediastinal, uh, uh, left and right axillary, as well as evidence of bone uh, metastases. Uh, so my question, uh, uh, probably Dr. Wong, uh, uh, historically, uh, how have these patients with metastatic uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma been managed? So unfortunately, historically, we've had very few systemic treatment options for patients with cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, and actually not that much data either. Much of uh, the data that we use to inform our practice for, for treatment really was extrapolated from what we, uh, how we manage uh, squamous cell carcinomas that arise elsewhere, specifically in the uh, other areas of the head and neck. Um, and so historically, cytotoxic chemotherapy with a platinum-based uh, chemotherapy regimen, much like this patient received, would have been um, our standard of care. Um, beyond that, anti-EGFR therapy, such as cetuximab, uh, would also have been a consideration. Uh, Dr. Amrik, uh, what is the role of surgery in patients with metastatic disease? I think the role is certainly limited, but it's not zero. It's a little bit more nuanced. We can think about the patients we talked about um, that are, have, have had a solid organ transplant and are not a candidate for immunotherapy and perhaps have an isolated lung mat that may very well be resectable with very acceptable morbidity that may offer very good long-term disease control. This disease is different than melanoma, for example. An isolated lung metastasis does not perhaps have the same uh, look ahead into the future of multiple liver and lung metastasis. And so surgical resection in a patient like that is not unreasonable to consider when there are not good systemic options uh, because of their other medical comorbidities. We also see patients who have a combination of regional and distant metastasis. Some of those regional metastasis can also be highly symptomatic. They can cause wounds, they can cause pain, and it may take a few months, several weeks uh, before that immunotherapy might work if it's going to work. And so perhaps for symptom relief and disease control, there may still be a role for considering surgical resection. That obviously has to be done within the context of a multidisciplinary team. I would say the last potential role is the patient with in-transit metastatic disease. As we think about the different phases of uh, metastatic disease, Many of these patients can be quite frail. Some of our transplant patients who have a localized in-transit metastasis and no other sites of disease, while we know that surgery is not going to cure that patient, it may provide some good local regional control, perhaps only for three months, perhaps only six months, perhaps longer, but in the right patient who perhaps does not want to pursue other treatments in the form of radiation or systemic therapies, that may be a very viable option. That may be a quick outpatient surgical procedure that takes 30 minutes and can actually provide some benefit to that patient. So it's much more nuanced and it's a more limited patient population. But that again is the benefit of having multi multidisciplinary discussion for this patient population. Absolutely. And, and obviously there is a role for radiation therapy in these patients, especially if uh, we have symptomatic patients with bone metastases uh, 
and that's you know uh, part of this multidisciplinary discussion as well. So, Dr. McCain, at this point, what are the systemic options for patients uh, upon uh, disease progression? How do we treat them today? I think today with the advent of simiflumab um, immune checkpoint inhibitor, I think that would be the first option for treatment. I think um, as we've discussed, patients that aren't candidates for either patients that have had um, transplants or other patients that you don't think would tolerate immune checkpoint inhibitors, the other option would be systemic chemotoxic agents. Um, however, the uh, data that we've had in the past, you know, the PFS for those is very limited. And so I think really uh, in this setting, the first line treatment would be simiflumab. That's good. So, uh, and, and this leads us uh, back to the uh, phase two EMPOWER study uh, that Dr. Emrick uh, introduced and discussed the design. And obviously this patient had, uh, this study had a group of patients with uh, metastatic disease, either distant metastases or inoperable regional lymph adenopathy uh, that were included and treated with semiflumab. Uh, the uh, dose was three milligram per kilogram uh, every two weeks intravenously up to 96 weeks. And they had tumor imaging uh, looking, uh, assessing response uh, every uh, eight weeks. Uh, they followed uh, rhesus criteria for this patient population. Uh, we have the same key inclusion criteria in terms of safety, obviously organ function, performance status, uh, ECOG uh, zero or one. Uh, and in terms of the exclusion criteria, most importantly, uh, lack of autoimmune disease, uh, organ transplant, and, and so on for patient uh, safety. Uh, the, uh, in the original publication in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last year, the response rate uh, in uh, uh, 28 of 50 was in 28 of 59 patients, so it was 47% uh, response rate uh, at a median follow-up of 7.9 uh, months. The response duration of more than six months was seen at about 57%. Uh, of uh, patients. And at the time of the uh, publication, 82% of patients uh, had continued uh, response on uh, treatment. Um, so for this patient, uh, on this, on this, uh, uh, our, our uh, 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 case, uh, he was started on simiflumab. Uh, they used the flat dose of 350 milligram uh, every three weeks intravenously uh, for uh, three cycles. Uh, repeat imaging with a PET CT scan showed significant reduction in the size and metabolic activity of the right and left axillary uh, lymphadenopathy as well as the mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Uh, the pulmonary nodules also had considerable uh, uh, reduction uh, in, uh, in size. Uh, 